to start. I know people are coming in, but let's start because time is very, very precious. Um, I want to first, my name is Dinda Elliott. I work for China Institute, and um, I wanted to first thank uh, Horasis and Frank Richter for organizing this important event and inviting me to moderate. As I said, I work for China Institute in New York, and our mission is to inform Americans about China through public programs, events like this, sometimes smaller, um, on business and technology and arts and culture. We're also trying to build people-to-people -people bridges uh, with the idea that the two most important economies of the world must find ways to work together. So this is a very, very tough time for US-China relations. For the first time ever, the United States has to face the fact that uh, there are now two superpowers, not just one. And that feels to many Americans, understandably, like a very scary thing, especially at a time when old economic models and sources of income are collapsing. China, meanwhile, is very proud and newly proud of its rising affluence and stature in the world, um, but is also apprehensive, afraid of giving up some of the advantages that have been built into its foreign investment regulations. China is fearful of opening its long protected markets to outside competition. You add those challenges to a newly assertive China on the geopolitical stage, and it sometimes looks like these two nations are moving towards, are on some kind of a collision course that could even lead to outright conflict. Um, it used to be that US businesses were the first ones to stand up and uh, defend the positive relationship with China. Uh, that's no longer necessarily the case, as you all know. Uh, the business community has run out of patience with China's continuing barriers to the China market. Um, the American government is wrestling with how to manage its biggest long-term rival, um, but also the United States' biggest trading partner, whose supply chains are crucial to industries like agriculture and manufa manufacturing. Um, so there are so many questions. Will expansive U.S. trade restri restrictions damage American companies? Uh, it's interesting, I was looking and found that efforts to regulate tech industries have backfired in the past. In the 1990s, the US imposed tight restrictions on exporting US satellite technology to protect an industry that the United States thought was important to national security. So what happened? The result was companies like Boeing and Lockheed Martin moved their satellite manufacturing overseas. On the Chinese side, meanwhile, the government's Made in China 2025 policy maps out industries of the future that China hopes to dominate, such as driverless cars and biomedicines. Uh, while China used to look to the United States as a model, especially after the 2008 financial crisis, China's one-time teacher, the US financial system does not look so great. Um, and at a time when decoupling is, is the buzzword, in Washington, D.C., the question is, what are the benefits on both sides of the U.S.-China business and trade relationship? I wanted to share a little anecdote in con to conclude before we jump into our conversation, which I think is a kind of a fascinating snapshot of the new reality in, US -China, in the U.S.-China business relationship. A friend of mine has founded a fast food, uh, a fast food, a chain of fast food uh, Chinese uh, restaurants in New York. And he's going over, he told me he's going over to China to look at the food industry there. But he's not looking at how he can export his fancy modern management model to China. China's food industry, he tells me, is far ahead of the United States. There are chain restaurants that are already successfully using robots to prepare food. And AI is already being widely de deployed in management systems. Delivery systems, of course, have far outstripped the likes of Uber Eats and, and Grubhub. No, my friend is not going to learn when he goes to China and to bring advanced technology. Instead, he's going to bring advanced technology back to his operations here, I, which I think is kind of a mind-blowing new reality. So given that new reality and today's tensions, what is the future of the US-China business and trade relationship? Today, I hope we'll explore uh, those, some of these issues. And now I want to turn to my amazing panel of speakers. So thank you for indulging me that. Um, first, I'll just do a couple of quick introductions. We have uh, Mr. Liu Qijong, who's vice chairman of Shanghai Zhenhua Heavy Industries. Um, we have Mr. Zhang Xingsheng, 
the founding partner right here, the founding partner of Daotong Fund, uh, who, by the way, worked many years for Ericsson in China and in marketing and has worked with uh, international companies for many years, investing in the United States. Um, and we have Mr. Ma Xuyao over there, who's the general manager of Shanxi Fast Auto Drive Group. Um, we have Governor Christy Nome, newly, about a year ago, elected as governor um, of South Dakota. And we have Governor Pete Ricketts from Nebraska. So it's an amazing panel of speakers who have a lot of experience dealing with US and China trade issues. So I'm gonna start with, on the American side, if I may. So I'm gonna start with you, Governor Nome. Um, I know that South Dakota is a huge exporter to China of soybeans and other agricultural products. So I wonder if you could share with us how the trade dispute has affected your exports and your economy more generally. have in the past. Um, they were utilized for several different uses, but also were impacted uh, by the pork industry that was there. But I know the African swine um, epidemic has impacted that demand as well. But, you know, this, this tariff dispute that we've had has dramatically um, impacted South Dakota. Mm -hmm. I would say that for us, we had low commodity prices for several years. And then to have this trade disruption and tariffs come into place uh, for our farmers was very difficult. Um, so we're seeing as a state and with the, their incomes, um, less market opportunities, lower prices. Um, our farmers aren't cash flowing quite as well and uh, struggling and would love to finalize an agreement with China and get it across the finish line because mm -hmm. uh, we recognize that our best opportunity to, to raise our families and be successful is to open up new doors to markets. Now, a couple of the barriers that we've had in the past were on the regulatory side with China. Uh, we maybe had an agreement that opened up those doors, but then we would get, um, you know, ships and uh, and different cargo loads rejected because of sanitary and phytosanitary regulatory issues. So I know that's one of the things we focused on in our trade agreement negotiations quite a bit, hmm. was not just opening the doors to a trade agreement, but also making sure that we had a fairness across the board on the regulatory side as hmm. well. How dependent is your economy on China? So what percent is it? You know, More China, than fifty percent of your on exports? the soybean side, China's in our top five customers. Uh -huh. uh, we've seen a decrease in what we export today. When we look at what we import from from China, we still the goods that we come as a whole to our state are five times more than what we export. But we have huge potential still in the soybean market. We also have a lot of potential in the beef and pork market as well. By the way, I love the fact that you just said, "Raise our families and be successful." Yeah. I think that's a kind of a common theme that we can touch upon too, which is this kind of about humanizing mm -hmm. what's going on, that in China, they're also trying to raise their families right. and be successful. I mean, it's just great to put it on that human well, level. And, and I think it's important for everybody to recognize that it's the growth of the middle class in China was good news for our farmers oh, that's in America. Fascinating. Yeah. It was yeah. because they recognized that that, that um, opened up new markets, more people had opportunities to purchase new goods and new foods for their families. And so that was something that we uh, were happy they to were see. You're welcomed. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Okay. So Jim Zhang, I wanted to ask you, so you have a Chinese company that's investing in early stage tech companies here in the States. Um, so we're really curious to hear about how your business has been affected by the current difficulties. And are you investing in technologies that could be considered matters of national security? Is that, has that become a problem for you and a challenge for you? What's, what's happened to your, your company and your investments? 
Thank you, Tinda. Uh, before I answer your question, very brief introduction about myself. I have been working in China for almost uh, over 40 years and uh, started from a government administration work, then in a state-owned company, then global company, then I start my, uh, my own business. Now I'd answer your question. <laughs> yes, we do have an investment fund, uh, both in currency of a Chinese uh, local uh, RMB and the US dollar. The Chinese uh, fund, we mainly invest into Chinese uh, internet company. And uh, for the US dollar fund, majority, eight, more than 80% we invest into US for the high tech uh, area, like a new material, like uh, 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 IT, uh, also like a, a medical ish, uh, instrument, uh, medical device. Our idea is that the innovation and the creativity in US is marvelous. It's one, the best in the world. Uh, university and the lab related and also laws. That's the reason we came into China, uh, US five years ago to start to invest into the high tech. And uh, our idea original, we could adopt the US uh, technology with a huge growth Chinese uh, consumer market to create a kind of uh, big market for both country. Mm -hmm. In first our uh, investment companies, we introduce an open door for them, but we also encourage the company to keep the R&D in US, but make the application market in China. And we have successfully transferred two companies into this kind of business model. Uh, one is a California-based flying car company, had been working with a Chinese car maker, Geely, and now they start to take order make a world first uh, bunch of uh, flying car. The car. Flying car? I'm right. sorry, what? <laughs> flying cars. The car can We're drive, here like, also oh, yeah, can sure. fly. It's, uh, the car already received uh, approval from uh, US American Federal, uh, federal uh, Aviation, and uh, now wow. it's uh, seeking approval from a Chinese, federal, uh, Chinese state uh, aviation uh, approval. Second, <coughs> we, we, we invest in a company uh, based in uh, Dallas. Then we set up a center in Hong Kong with the Hong Kong University for the uh, robot. And uh, one of the products they produced uh, uh, two years ago is called uh, Sophia, oh. Robert Sophia. Oh, Sophia now Sophia. is a okay. kind of a Robert celebrity in the world. And uh, study. Looks like a human being. Uh, yeah. We believe in US, in, in North America, in Japan, Soon will be in China, the aging problem. Then the mm. old people need to pe uh, young uh, wow. to communicate with a human-like person. Mm. Cannot only talk to the Google uh, uh, yeah. uh, music box. Yeah. So this kind of things huh. would come to be a very uh, interesting market. And we also invest into the uh, like a, a wireless charging for mobile phone, not more for, for automobile, for cars. Oh. This, uh, uh, new energy or EV car, China is the number one market in the world. So the technology in US then adopted in China would be perfect. But uh, last year, we couldn't continue doing it in this way. Okay. So you ask me a question whether- Why, uh, why you couldn't because- Because of this uh, uh, US uh, new policy and uh, CFIUS uh, control. Okay. Yeah, CFIUS control mm -hmm. or approval. Mm -hmm. uh, normally we only invested less than 5% as a first state, then bring the company into a big market, then we uh, follow with another bunch of uh, investment, but we will require a board position. But according to the new rules, it's uh, very hard. So mm -hmm. that means that those companies could have a great future and uh, link China market with the US originated technology, now would have a problem they have to stay in US or in other parts of the world and uh, away from the world's largest uh, consumer market. Right. So that's a problem between uh, the situation between the two countries. Uh, you ask me whether my technology could be used for military. Mm -hmm. We never invested in anything directly in, uh, uh, into the military. We are not allowed, actually. Right. Yeah. But anything can be used for military. 
uh, steel, sure. yeah. copper, um, anything, plastic. Right. So if anyone say you are guys that produce that thing, so for military use, that yeah. I think uh, all of the manufacturer would have this uh, yeah. kind of a blame. Yeah, so the question is where do you draw the line? Where do you, yeah. how yeah. do you define yeah. right. it? Yeah. So, uh, so that's, uh, we see kind of difficulties, but uh, I still, do, still believe technology was created by the talent there should be benefit for human being. Not it depends on whether he's American or he's Chinese. It's a, the, the, the market, the human being, would, only the technology could uh, push the world, go forward. Mm -hmm. So I still believe this is a short-term uh, situation mm -hmm. could be solved mm -hmm. in future. Depends on the Leaders, <laughs> we yeah. always follow the leaders. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Okay, that's wonderful. There's a lot that we can come back to. Um, hopefully we'll have time um, um, later in the conversation. So I wanted to ask um, Liu Qijong, um, so your company, uh, which is the um, Shanghai Jinhua Heavy Industries, you told yes. me that it produces 70% of the big cranes that are being used in U.S. ports, right? Yes. So you're obviously mm -hmm. very connected to the U.S. Mm -hmm. market, and you know the U.S. market. You know about U.S.-China mm -hmm. trade very, very well. Um, tell us a little bit about how your business has been affected by the current trade war. Yeah. Uh, actually, our business started with, <coughs> sorry, with Canada and the USA um, back to 25, year, 25 years ago in 1994. We started from a business in Miami, Florida, and then uh, gradually we, we are spreading our products almost everywhere in the USA and in the world. The trade uh, conflict, US, China, uh, does, so we are from manufacturing, does infect all of our manufacturing business, including ours a little bit. And uh, just a little bit fortunately, those major cranes they were invented by the U.S. Uh, 50 years ago. The U.S. has no manufacturer today. Ah. So 30, 40 years ago, you gave up this industry to mm. Korean, to Japan, to the European, com European companies. And the ZPMC picked up 25 years ago. So we are the major supplier here. And um, because U.S. is not producing anymore, so these uh, cranes were removed from the tariff nest. But still, some of our other manufacturers, like the spare parts, some other products are uh, subject to higher tariff, mm -hmm. which, which is uh, a problem for, for us. So for me, the, the tariff uh, bearing is not good for anyone, for either China or the, for the USA. Right, okay, great. Thank you for sharing that. So Governor Ricketts, I wanted to ask you, I know that Nebraska is a big beef exporter. Um, You've seen beef, my understanding is that you've seen beef exports to China open up after President Trump was elected, right? And then uh, with tariffs dropping after he took office. What's happened since then? What's happened? And, and, and also, just more generally, how would you see the U.S.-China trade war affecting uh, your economy? Sure. So, well, first of all, Nebraska is known as the beef state. And so uh, we are. Uh, we know. Big we love your beef. We love your beef. We love our beef, right? <laughs> and uh, so uh, I think to Governor Noem's comment about the rising middle class in yeah. China, we view that as good news too. Because as people have more disposable income, they can spend more on things like beef. So yep. we were excited about that. And actually, the, the converse, I actually had a conversation with then candidate Trump before he was elected. Uh, during the campaign, he visited Omaha, Nebraska. And I was talking to him about TPP, the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, yep. and why that was important for Which Nebraska. Which you were in favor of. I was yes. in favor of, exactly. And during the course of that conversation, I said that you know China was close to our beef. And so he went out in that rally right afterwards and pledged to open up the beef market to China. And of course, that's what he was able it's to do. He got politician. elected in 2016. He was good. He delivered on his promise. <laughs> uh, worked with President Xi. And in 2017, we saw that market open up. Uh, which had been closed to us for about 14 years. Now, in 2017, Nebraska sold about $17 million in beef to China. And we were, we have supplied, the, the state of Nebraska is about half of all the U.S. beef hmm. that is going to China. Mm -hmm. To put it in perspective, though, 
that $17 million out of about, uh, 2017 we exported $1.26 billion. So just a really tiny part. And in 2018, it was $32 million out of $1.44 billion. So a really small market. And just uh, also, but the Chinese beef market is growing quickly. Hmm. So in 2013, I think China imported about a billion dollars worth of beef. In 2015, that had risen to two billion. By 2018, that had risen to almost five billion, 4.9 billion. So again, we see that rising middle class demanding beef. And we know, uh, and most of that's coming from either like Australia, New Zealand, South America. That's where most of that beef is coming from. And so we know uh, to, as kind of newcomers to that market, we're gonna have to break into it. You know, uh, our beef is grain fed, you know, corn fed. So it's, it's uh, tastes better, it's got more fat in it. I mean, it's just a better product. Uh, but that we have to educate consumers about that because it's also more expensive. So mm. in many ways, we have to do that. Uh, right now, where we are is we started out at the same tariff levels as most of the other companies, but with uh, the trade dispute, uh, we're now, our tariffs are, uh, <coughs> let's see, what are we sitting at? 47 or 49% tariffs compared to 12% tariffs. That's kind of the standard tariff. So On the beef export? On the beef, yeah. So our beef has got four times the tariff as just about anybody else's beef. So another obstacle that we have to overcome. And so, you know, relative in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's an intriguing new market for us, but still very small, and we still have a lot of disadvantages on the tariffs, and just on the other things too, the Governor Noam was talking about the non-tariff trade barriers as well. So we know we've got some obstacles to overcome there, but we're- What kinds of non-tariff non um, barriers? You know, uh, there's a, a, a hormone that's used in cattle called uh, ractopine, uh, ractopamine, okay. Okay. and so there, the, there's, there's residue levels that you can't have, which means that generally you gotta raise the cattle specifically for the Chinese market, which means if you're right. a cattle producer in the U.S. and you're raising it specifically for the Chinese market, um, you gotta charge a premium for it. So another cost right. barrier there. And you have to figure out how to use the whole animal. Mm -hmm. You gotta make sure that, you know, not just the best cuts are going to China, but because you're preparing that animal for China, all the other parts of the animal have right. to go to China too. Right, mm -hmm. right. So again, it just creates some more logistical right. market kind of right. challenges for mm -hmm. somebody who wants to produce for the Chinese mm -hmm. market. Mm -hmm. Now we do this already for other markets too, like the European Union. You know, we'll do the same kind of things, mm -hmm. but it just creates another level of uh, challenge to it. And you know, just in general to your question about the overall, how does it impact Nebraska? If you look, the, our actually trade with China had been declining since 2012. Okay. So uh, we would like to see a market that is consistent and growing. Uh, I'll give you some examples. So for example, in 2013, we sold about $119 million of corn to China, and in 2014, that was $11 million. That wasn't Trump, that wasn't a trade dispute, that was just China didn't buy our corn. Um, in 2014, we sold about or $283 million worth of hides, right? Cattle business, we got hides. Um, and in 2016, that had fallen to $170 million. Uh -huh. Again, that wasn't Trump, that wasn't trade dispute, that was just China buying less of our so stuff. So is there anything you can do in terms of regulation that would guarantee a more stable market? I mean, what can be done to address those kinds of issues? Well, that's a great question, because I mean, part of it's market driven, Yeah. right? And they so- They don't want your hides, or they do want your hides, that's yeah, the right. way it goes. So I think part of it, and it, what we want to address is the tariff issues, the, the non-tariff trade barriers, to make sure we've got a consistent growing marketplace. Uh, I think Governor Noam was talking about soybeans. You know, in 2018, I think we sold almost half of our soybeans went to China, 80% uh -huh. of our sorghum. So that's, so, soybeans is about the only commodity that we really had a big consistent marketplace mm -hmm. with China on. Uh -huh. and, uh, and she also referenced the African swine fever. That's also gonna be hurting demand for soybeans regardless of the trade disputes. So it's a big complicated picture right, <laughs> with right, regard right, to all right, these right, things right. going yeah. on. But ultimately what we'd like to see is just uh, you know, a, a, a consistent growing marketplace right. to have opportunities for our farmers and ranchers to be yeah. able to sell our yeah. agricultural goods. Yeah, what I love about what you were saying and what Governor Nome said is, you know, you said it's a big complicated picture, which I think often gets lost in the headlines, you know, that, and you also said that, um, you know, you also see the rise of the Chinese middle class as a good thing. Yeah, That's absolutely. a growing market for you. Yeah. And I think that also gets lost in the headlines and certainly gets, seems to get lost in the, um, increasingly sort of, I think, um, you know, monosyllabic conversation in DC, um, which doesn't have that kind of nuance about how it's a complicated story, you know, and-, and uh, 
you can also build consistency into the negotiations on trade agreements as well. For instance, phase one I of see. the China-US negotiation is coming out within a week or two. Um, and it, what I'm told is on the ag product side, there will be a $50 billion level of ag <coughs> product negotiations that will be just in phase one. That's significant for the United States. Mm -hmm. And so if you can set that level and have that actually in the agreement, that brings some of the consistency that we need to produce those commodities. I mm -hmm. see, yep. Okay, so Ma Xiao, last but definitely not least. Um, your company, um, Shanxi Fast Auto Drive Group, um, you do tons of huge business in China and export some as well, but I know that your company has several joint ventures with U.S. companies, including Caterpillar, um, making gear parts and shafts for both the U.S. and the Chinese markets, yeah? Um, so I'm really curious about under the current trade war pressures, are those joint ventures under threat in any way? Um, how has your company benefited from those joint ventures, and how do you think that Caterpillar, for example, might have benefited from that joint, those joint ventures. Well,我需要用中文回答这些。可以，可以，可以，没问题。对。啊，我不像我的朋友们，呃，英语表达非常流利。你的英文也非常好，我听，可是没关系。对。这个法式特公司呢，用的英文FASTD协议，啊，它是
perception, but, it, but this is out there, definitely. China's learned ev everything from the United States, either legally or illegally. Um, and that, you know, the United States shouldn't be sharing our in systems and technology anymore. Basically, enough is enough. You know, the China, the China of today is not the same as the China of 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, to, to the extent that even in D.C., I am told um, that your patriotism can be called into question mm. if you kind of stand up and defend uh, a, a positive relationship with China these days. So I'm really curious about what it feels, what's it like in, in South Dakota these days? Is that mood really different from the mood in D.C. that I'm describing? Or, you know, what does it feel like? And I'd love to hear as well from Governor Ricketts about that. Well, you know, having spent the last eight years in D.C. and yep. specifically working on trade um, issues, I think in the past uh, we have felt as though America, the United States, did not necessarily have a level playing field when yes. it came to trade agreements. Yep. And that this president and administration has come in working for more fairness in that. And there's been a lot of discussions around, you know, the controversial issues like um, currency manipulation, intellectual property protection, all of those things that Americans talk about a lot and want to have addressed in trade agreements. I'd say that that resonates in South Dakota, although overwhelmingly still in the committees that make the policy with the trade ambassador who has a discussion, mm -hmm. all the way down to the folks that are on Main Street in South Dakota, they recognize the value of a relationship with China. Uh -huh. um, I don't think any of them want to completely disregard and ignore the economic powerhouse that is China, uh, the market that it opens up for us, um, the opportunities that it provides, although they also want some recognition um, for our presence as well mm -hmm. and some fair treatment and a level mm -hmm. playing field. Yeah. And, and in the past, we haven't gotten that. Yeah. And so I think that is really what people appreciate about um, this president and what he's trying to do is they see him fighting some of those issues to really protect what is uniquely American and, and be able to still market and develop relationships with those countries. He, he certainly has not slammed the door to not, to not opening up those markets. Yeah. What I think will happen is we have a trade agreement that is very close to the finish line, the USMCA tra trade agreement. It has language in it, it has negotiated um, verbiage in it that if that were to get ratified by the House soon, it sets the table for many more of these trade agreements and the China agreement uh, to getting finalized quite quickly. And it would be good for both countries. Yep. We are two powerhouses in the world that while we're very different, have different um, beliefs and economies, um, I, it's, it's a disservice to both countries to ignore each other. Mm -hmm. And in South Dakota, I think probably because we're uniquely agricultural, we're uniquely impacted by what we can export and sell overseas, um, the people understand that. Yeah, one thing I always wish um, wasn't lost in the political conversations is a sense of history. Yeah. That, you know, you talk about leveling the playing field, and I think everybody agrees. I mean, I want to ask later, does everybody agree that the mm -hmm. playing field needs to be leveled? But it seems like there's a pretty clear consensus that it's not fair yeah. right now. Right. But when it, it sort of implies a sense of lack of goodwill in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think that in the past, China was not at the stage of development that China's in now, nor was the market as, as you know, uh, huge as it is now. And so, you know, things have changed. And so, okay, what was okay back then is no longer okay that now. That's a way of casting it that's a little bit different from saying, damn it, the you know, this is just unfair. They've been screwing us from the get-go and we need to, need to change the rules. You know, and I, I guess that might be perspective and if it, stops us from making progress, right. then definitely language can change. Right. But there were some, some actions in the past that um, we felt like we're not upholding to what was agreed to yes. in previous trade agreements. Yes, no, no yeah. question about that, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I, I, Linda, I think that is an important perspective, though, that I, I mentioned this last night as well, going back to World War II and the Bretton Woods Conference, that the United States actually had a specific policy mm -hmm that the trade relationships were going to be unfair, mm -hmm. that the United States would be the last resort, mm -hmm. last market for the world mm -hmm. to buy stuff. And this was part of the policy to help rebuild Europe and mm -hmm. Japan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this has got a historical legacy to it. It's not just specifically about China. That's we have the same issues, for example, with Europe. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. right? So yeah. 
th this is not something that is unique to China that, hey, the playing field wasn't level. Right. And because it was actually designed to be not level right. back up to World War II. But to your point, the world has changed, right? The right. world has changed. China has obviously changed quite a bit since yep. World War II. And that's where, again, the relationship needs to change as well. So where there may have been unfair trading advantages, not just for China, but other countries as well that have to be addressed. Um, now that's part of what we're going through, not, and not just for China, right? This is other countries yeah. as well that we're going through and saying, hey, we need to l have a level playing field. You know, the same sanitary and phytosanitary issues that you were referencing yes. with regard to China, we're having those discussions with the European Union. Right. Uh, I was just in Vietnam last month having the same sort of discussions about sanitary and phytosanitary mm -hmm. uh, issues and biotechnology mm -hmm. and really mm -hmm. trying to get that level playing field with all of our trading partners. And so I think that what, so you, you ask if, you know, if, if Washington, D.C. is its own bubble, yeah. okay? Yeah. So you shouldn't pay attention to anything that goes on there from the standpoint <laughs> of how the American people feel. <laughs> right. You have to get out to the middle part of the country, the real America. Yeah. And I do think you, what Governor Ohm was describing is exactly right. That, you know, that people do want to have a level playing field. They do want it to be fair. But they do see that China's rising middle class is a good news for the American farmer and rancher. That we see what happens in other countries when the middle class rises. That they want to buy more of our high quality agricultural products. And that's a good thing. Right. So I, I think that's what you know we want to see have happen, and that's part of what we're really going through right now. Is and this I think the title of this panel was supposed to be the long road about yes, how we're doing yes, this. Yes, yes, It's exactly right. It's going right. to be a long road as we reforge this relationship, yep. where we want to have that access to consistent growing marketplaces, where we want to have intellectual property be protected, where we want to have symmetrical business rules with regard to investment and finance yes, and all yes, those yes. sort of things mm -hmm. that are not there today. Right but need to be there today if we're going to have a peer-to-peer -peer type relationship. Right, right, right. Re may, reciprocity. Yes, please. Let me add a comment to Governor Griffiths mm -hmm. about the order since World War II. And just one little comment. China actually has been following the rules. You, are, you, are, you made the rules. The U.S. Yep. made the rules. Yep. China has been following up that rules. And uh, we understand because of new change, both in the U.S. and China, you would like to change your rules, which will be okay. I just want, uh, we can have the common sense or agreement soon so that the uh, economy can grow better on both sides. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But you raise a really important point, which I think you know goes a little bit back to what I was saying about my friend with the fast food <coughs> restaurants, where he's actually going to learn from China now and bring the stuff back here, is that, you know, Ch I, I talk to Chinese people who are, say that kind of, you know, we've been following the rules that were established by the United States forever, and kind of things are changing now, and they need mm -hmm. to change, and that's complicated mm -hmm. and hard for Americans to deal with, and to, you know, it's, good, it's gonna be a long road, as mm -hmm. you said, it's gonna be a long road. Um, so I'm curious to hear from you guys who are based, well, I guess you're all kind of based in China, I know you're also mm -hmm. in the States, but um, that, tell us a little bit about the Chinese perspective, you know, how, anti-US is China becoming these days. Um, I have heard that in some, again, it's kind of extreme, Jidlan, the, you know, there are some people, If it, again, same thing, if you stand up and say something good about America, you can be criticized for being anti-patriotic or not Chinese enough, or whatever. Tell us a little bit about what, what the feeling is in China these days. Okay, I could uh, share my opinion with you, with uh, the audience. I, I, I didn't, I don't feel any kind of anti-US kind of common feeling in Chinese society. Okay. I, generally speaking, Chinese understand the US much better than you Americans yes. understand the China. Yes, well that's for damn sure, yes. And uh, if you ask any uh, graduate or uh, any students in the university, what will be their next goal for further study? Mm -hmm. Their first pick up U.S. university. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, when they're trying to get in U.S. university, to learn everything about the U.S. from the institution to the states to the, for, for example, I, I was born in the 50s. In my age, we know nothing about mm -hmm. U.S. But after opening, Everything we are talking about is the U.S. So now I don't, don't believe what their, their nonsense on the website. 
in the common ordinary people, they feel U.S. help China in the Second World War. Mm. We are the alliances. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. But uh, certainly now the, on the wives, there there's some kind of uh, other feelings. It's like uh, uh, President the, Trump the, says uh, yeah. fake uh, yeah. news. Yeah. It's uh, also fake uh, explanation. Right. But to look at uh, those uh, China-U.S. Uh, relationship, I want to use a very simple example. We all have kids. When kids was uh, little, we can teach him or her to do everything. When he or she grow up a little bit, she will argue with you. When he <laughs> grow up to be adult, you cannot hit his or her bottom anymore. Right. <laughs> you have to be friend with him or her. Say, hey guys, let's talk about that. <laughs> Today, it's like this. The grandfather still there? Mm -hmm. But kids grow up. Yeah. But father still want to hit the kids bottom. Yeah. <laughs> so, how can we do? We have to admit, he is not a kid anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. He is an adult. Right. Let's find a way to act, play as an adult. Mm -hmm. Negotiation, talk, and uh, this kind of uh, heavy tariff is only can solve a short issue, mm -hmm. never can solve long-term issue. Yeah. Right, short-term, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. What do, you, what do you see? Can I just ask, by the way, can somebody tell me when we have 10 minutes left? Sure, we can. Okay, that would be great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think I agree with you, Mr. Zhang, that in China, we don't feel a lot of people are against the USA. Okay. We, we don't have such feelings. And as Mr. Zhang said, I also fully agree, a lot of Chinese know USA, know American, even the culture, uh, actually better than the US knows yeah. China. I, I agree with that. And only politically, because the President Trump sometimes was pretty hostile against the Chinese, so our newspapers have to publish something, like uh, saying right. against the USA, right. but not, uh, yeah. that does not uh, say the, the entire Chinese are against right. the US. I don't have such right. at all. Right, right, interesting, okay. I would like to add uh, one and story. And then Mr. Ma needs to speak in, yeah. but speak up. Okay, yeah, hold I on. think it is. Hold okay. your fire, uh, hold your fire. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's Mr. Ma's turn. Yeah, sorry. <laughs>呃中国对美国的影响是有限的美国对中国的影响是更大一些这也是基于前面张总提到的中国对美国的了解要远远多于美国对中国的了解中国和美国的一些极端化的言语在中国是存在的但是它不代表主流主流的声音呢还是希望
to sign the paper together with the government. Almost three months, she refused to come. Without her present, the agreement cannot be put into effective. Finally, by a lot of work, she came. I said, why are you so reluctant to come to Beijing for, for this agreement? Then she told me, oh, you know, I'm so worried. This is the first time I got into the Communist Party. Oh. Uh, control the country. <laughs> oh my God. I said, oh, wow. okay. Come on. Feel it. Tell me later. Three days later, I invited her for a drink in the China World, Beijing China World Hotel. I said, tell me what is China is a Communist Party controlled uh, country. She told me after three days, she said, I feel you are more than you are more capitalism exactly. than U.S. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> we are named communist, uh, communist yep. country, yep. but uh, we are real capitalism country. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, so I do want to hear from you all. Do do I mean I think that Western companies have been very frustrated, as Gov Governor Noam has said, on technology transfer requirements, various non-tariff barriers. They've made it really difficult for American companies to succeed in China. And so I want to hear. Do you all agree, basically, that now that China is much more developed than it was, say, ten or twenty years ago, um, do you agree, all of you, that the rules of business do need to be reworked? If China, you know, in China, to allow for a more level playing field, what do you know? I'd love to hear from all of you. Well, the way we we discuss it when we're discussing the policy and negotiation of trade agreements is a modernization of the language, mm. um, and it's just natural that every kind of huh. agreement, contract, something you would do in business would be you would modernize that agreement, uh -huh. uh, which makes it much more workable for both entities that are entering into that trade agreement. So. That's how I look at it. I don't so what, necessarily. What do, you mean, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, for instance, when you're looking at these trade agreements, if they haven't been renegotiated for 25 years, obviously situations have changed. Right, Things I have see. Changed. Yeah. Um, there's different entities involved and different barriers that have gradually been established. Um, maybe one country has set up some regulatory barriers yeah. outside of that trade agreement that has stopped the flow into the market. Mm -hmm. So that's why when you modernize a trade agreement and renegotiate it, it's looking at the environment that we're operating in today, trying to view 10, 15 years down the road to make sure you're prepared for that, and then make sure that it is treating both countries fair. So yeah. just when those discussions are being had you know, with the negotiators, that's the viewpoint. They're not looking at punishing a country that's been a bad actor in the past. They're looking at what has gone wrong in the past and how do we modernize it to make mm -hmm. sure that it's much more mm -hmm. fair in the future. Mm -hmm. What do the Chinese here think about the need, whether we need to rewrite the rules of business in China? For me, I, I do hear a lot uh, about criticism against the China for the technology transfer and for yep. the like a patent copyright protection. And uh, in my very limited knowledge, I did not see this. I feel this uh, issue are somehow exaggerated by, by some reasons. Uh, from our side in, in China, uh, for the business I'm, I'm with, I did not see any of those uh, specific examples for yeah. like forced uh, technology transfer. I did not even see yeah. a single one. Yeah. And I also, I think um, China today, we are also, we, f we agree with you, this uh, protecting the, the, the patent, the, the innovation, this is very important. We are, uh, uh, like uh, there were some problems before, but the government is taking strong measures to do protect those copyright, those patents. Let me just add before I want to hear your, your answer to that question, but I wanted to add a little extra nuance, which is that I think that in China there are a lot of private enterprises which also want to rewrite the rules of business and want to have a more level playing field against the state owned enterprises. And so that touches on a much bigger challenge that the government in China faces is how are, what are they gonna do about their own vested interests, political interests, powerful vested interests. So. Uh, I'll say, 
的所有的规章制度，没有违反过 WTO 的什么协定，从来也没有明文规定，必须在中国进行生产的时候强制性要求技术转移。之所以会产生部分知识产权，啊，不管是欧洲的、美国的，还是一些发达国家，在中国，主要是在企业合资合作的时候，通过双方商议带来的技术协议转移。比如说，在我们汽车行业是最为明显的。中国现在已经成为世界上最大的汽车制造国和消费国，很多公司为了更快地进入中国的汽车市场，都不约而同地选择了迅速的技术转让，在合资公司进行生产。所以说呢，在技术转让的这个过程当中呢，其实是一个商业商谈形成的结果，不是政府强制性推行的结果。There are there are companies that will say, however, that you're right that the government nobody forced them. This was basically voluntary technology transfer. But they will say, if I didn't do that, I couldn't possibly get into the Chinese market. So it's kind of like you know you're you're <laughs> voluntary, you know, like that. Anyway, the, so right. Sure. <laughs> 在中国的企业里边，的确分国有企业、私营企业，包括一些中外的合资公司。那么在改革开放的初期呢，国家的政策确实是有所倾斜的，比如说可能倾向于外资企业，倾向有一段时间可能还倾向于民营企业。那么现在呢，在国家的政策当中，基本上不再区分企业的资本的来源，不区不区分这些企业性质。采用一盘棋的方法，那么民营企业呢，确确实实有一些呢，是希望像国有企业一样，主要是在一些国家关注民生的一些领域当中，可能国家是有一些限制性政策的，啊，比如说这个涉及到这个电信行业、交通，就是就是电网，就是由于必须靠大规模的这种集约化的方式。才能实现规模优势的一些关系到国际民生的一些行业里边，国家可能确实仍然有一些保护的政策，它也是符合中国目前的国情的，啊，所以这一块呢，从中国政府也好，包括我们这些企业，你像我们这些国有企业，我们作为一个国有企业里边一部分，现在国家还在强调混合经济，啊，所谓混合经济就是希望国有企业和民营企业两家合资合作，利用好双方各自的这种机制优势。来发展生产，所以说中国的政府，我觉得目前的市场化情况是越来越开放，啊，它已经在逐步的尽可能的消除不同企业性质之间带来的政策上的差异，所以这一块呢，我倒觉得，经过四十年的发展，啊，我想我们作为国内企业也好，还是咱们的外国朋友也好，都能看到它的这种政策调整，它是一个进步的调整，啊，我相信以后也是这样。嗯。That also gets into a very complicated philosophical and economic question of what a country should do to develop its economy, right? So China has followed the East Asian model, which is basically you protect, protect your economy, let the domestic industry rise, and then you open it up. And that's, you know, many Asian economies did that very, very successfully. Um, so, you know, but it obviously it leads to some frustration when, for example, in the finance industry, you know, it's been protected so long that basically China is so far ahead of the United States in terms of, of um, you know, payments, um, payment systems that if you open it up, there's no way any American companies could to succeed anyway. So, so that gets into complicated stuff. Um, I think as a last question, because it looks like our time is almost up, I want to ask each of you, I want to ask the Chinese to tell us what do you think China needs to do to get over these hurdles? And I want to ask the governors to talk about what does the United States need to do to get over these hurdles. So anybody who wants to jump in. Okay, I could uh, take first. I think all Chinese people would be agree with uh, the 40 years of reforming opening policy the every citizen in China improved their life and uh, changed the country tremendously. Mm -hmm. So that, that already gave the answer. The only way is to still continue your, what means the correct way. Any kind of a closing door or go back is die. Mm -hmm. 
So for this reason, I really think the alert from uh, President Trump to China, to Chinese government, is good because we sometimes the government get into the comfort zone. They forgot what to do for continue performing or continue opening. Mm -hmm. So this alert uh -huh. really gave kind of a, kind of a weak signal. So the, no matter Chinese people or their company, we believe only way keeping Deng Xiaoping opening policy and uh, to work more, even more aggressively. I hope that can be a way to solve the both country problem. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned Deng Xiaoping because he often gets forgotten in, yeah. these, in these conversations these days. We, we, our age, we never can forget. Right, right, okay, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I agree, that's a good, good answer, very good answer. Okay, um, shall we go, go to Governor No? Sure, sure, you know, for um, United States, I would say it's to continue to press to get more agreements. Many times we let one issue stop us from making progress mm. on all the issues. Um, so to continue to come to the table and recognize the opportunities for both countries is incredibly important. And one of the comments that was made earlier about the United States and Americans not understanding China, mm. like China understands America, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Yep. One of the things that we've done specifically in South Dakota is focus a lot more on um, tourism, um, right. bringing a lot more Chinese visitors to our state, um, uh, targeting them, sending our officials there, our state government employees there to China, to Beijing, to understand uh, the country, the people, the culture, and to build relationships that in the past we haven't focused on before. So um, I, th I think it's impressive how the children in China start learning English at the age of four or five, six mm -hmm. years old, yeah. recognizing the importance of the relationship. And, and we in the United States have not as aggressively built that relationship. We do have big, strong differences yeah. in many ways, yeah. um, but we still have opportunities that we can partner to help both countries help their families. And I think that should always keep us at that table pressing to make sure that we find common ground on those important areas we can open up new markets for our businesses. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm always surprised when, you know, some very good friends who are very um, well read and know the world and mm -hmm. read the newspaper front to back, their first trip to China, they will come back and say, oh my God, yeah. I had yeah. no idea how modern it is. Yeah. And there's this gap. People think that about South Dakota, too. Yes, <laughs> I, I'm sure. Yeah, that's a, gr a great point. That's right. <laughs> All right, I'm coming to South Dakota. That's right, I'm you definitely need to. coming. Yeah, me too. But you know, it was so fun. We have a Buffalo Roundup in South Dakota every year, mm -hmm. and we had a lot of Chinese visitors come and visit oh, and that's absolutely great. loved it. So there are parts oh, of South great. Dakota that is the wild, wild west. Yes, yes. The other places we have electricity and <laughs> houses. And, yes, right. Wonderful. It's, yes. <laughs> Toilets are coming Toilets soon. Toilets are coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Governor Ricketts. Uh, well, Governor Oma, we're in the same category about yeah. people being surprised when they come to Nebraska, so that's really too bad. And I would also agree with the other comments with regard to that exchange, and that's why I think the cultural exchanges are so important. Mm -hmm. The University of Nebraska has a number of different relationships with uh, institutions in China, Bellevue University, uh, a private university in Omaha, has also got uh, relationships in China. I think those things mm -hmm. are important. Uh, you know, we signed a, a sister state agreement in Shanxi province and have a demonstration farm. And Great. So I think those sort of things do help establish that, that understanding because I would also agree that Americans don't understand China. So I think that's an important aspect. And I think that also for us to overcome these obstacles, as I mentioned, things are changing. We set up uh, a system going back, you know, 75 years, and Americans are questioning that system. So part of what we have to do is figure out what we want. What do we yeah. want the new system to right. look like. What do we mm -hmm. want these relationships, not with just China, but the entire world to look mm -hmm. like. So I think that's another one of our, one of the, ob one of the things we have to, to figure out is what do we want these relationships to look like if we're then going to negotiate a trade agreement because mm -hmm. we have right. to know where we want to end, you know, start with the end in mind. Yeah, and that historical perspective that you brought in earlier is I think so important in terms of just recognizing things change. Okay, it was, that's, this is the way it was back then, but now realities have changed, so how do we face that? and deal with it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, 
more open dialogue like uh, what we are doing today to help to, to solve some of the mis misunderstandings. I just want to go back a little bit about uh, uh, what, what you mentioned, the Chinese government protects our industry so yes. well. I just, w w one more comment for that is uh, we have learned those areas that protected were not successful at all. Only those areas that uh, were not protected, they got m more popular in China. So oh, wow. I am very sure wow. government will be <coughs> opening the door wider to the world. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah, go ahead. Mm. Uh, uh, Thank you. I, so I think we all agree that conversations like this are incredibly <coughs> beneficial. And again, to kind of go back to the sort of human aspect of all of it, that we're all in economies, we're all trying to raise our families and do well in the world and to sort of keep that perspective, that it's about figuring out the best way forward. And I just want to thank you all so much for your uh, deep thinking about these things and willingness to take on challenging, challenging subjects and, and um, answer with honesty. And um, thank you so much. It was a great panel. Thank you.